What's up, Real Life family? Thanks for joining us today for Real Life Online. We're so grateful for this opportunity to worship with you. Today, we're kicking off our new series, City of Light, where we'll study how our identities as followers of Christ can help us live in and reflect His light in a city surrounded by darkness. We're almost ready to get started, but before we do, let's worship together. Good morning, Real Life. Come on, let's stand to our feet today. We've come to lift up worship to our King. Come on, let's sing together. I wish I could tell you, wish I could describe it, but I can contain it, can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture, and not enough words to ever say what I found. Come on, he's wonderful. He's wonderful and beautiful.
like to be hopeful and free, let's let our little light shine. Open up the windows and let the light in. Open up the windows and let the light in. Open up the windows and let the light in. Let his light in. Let the light in.
that up all over the room today. Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Hey, Real Life, it's so awesome to be hanging out with you today. Thanks for tuning in. If you are new here, we'd love the opportunity to connect with you. You can do so by scanning the QR code on your screen and filling out our connect form. That way we can get you plugged into the life of our church and let you know of all the ways that we can better serve you. If you need prayer today, we would be honored to pray with you. Simply leave your prayer request in the chat, or if you're on a platform that doesn't have a chat, email us at prayer at real.life and our team will be praying with you. This week marks the start for most schools in the area. Parents are celebrating kids going back to school and kids are celebrating an amazing summer. No matter how you look at it, we'll all be celebrating next Sunday at our back to school after parties happening throughout all of our campuses. Bring your family and friends for a fun time. It's gonna be a blast for everyone. We also wanna invite you to join us for worship night on August 28th as all real life campuses unite for an amazing night of praise and worship to our savior, Jesus. It's a celebration you won't wanna miss. Doors will open at 6 p.m. to give you time to secure a spot and grab some free ice cream. Yeah, you heard it right. We'll have Kelly's ice cream in the house and free for the first 200 people. It's gonna be a night filled with music, community, and God's presence. So mark your calendars, invite your friends, and get ready for a worship experience unlike any other. We also wanna take the opportunity to celebrate your generosity this summer. All July, we collected school supplies for Tools for School to support local schools in our area and bless teachers and families who needed it the most. We are thrilled to report that we were able to put together over 100 full bags of school supplies. The pictures you see are last week's drop off at Ariella Cole Academy in downtown Claremont. We want you to know how much we value your generosity. We couldn't fulfill the mission God has given us without your help. If you would like to give, you can do so through our app or through our website at real.life slash give, which you can access by scanning the QR code on your screen. We're about to kick off today's message and our new series, City of Light. But before we do that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the offering that you've given us and for the opportunity to serve our communities. Thank you for the offering we're going to receive. I ask that you bless it. I ask that you help us to use it for your good and your glory. I also wanna pray for the message that is going to be spoken today. I wanna to pray that you would speak to our hearts, you would speak to our minds, and that you would move in a powerful way. Thank you, Lord, for being good. We love you, and in your holy and precious name we pray, amen.
great to see you guys. And we are kicking off a new series. By the way, uh, new church merch in the house. Are you seeing this? You know you're in the right church when they got merch that looks like Saved by the Bell, okay? It's giving Zach Morris right now. But you see this? Let love take over. This is, hey, this is, you can only get this. I just found out. I didn't even know. This is exclusive to worship night, which is in a couple weeks. I think like a week and a half or something like that. We're having our worship night. Got to be here for that if you want the gear. But this is Let Love Take Over is the theme of our worship night this year. So I hope to see you guys there. I think it's Wednesday, It's the last Wednesday of the month. I believe that's the 28th. Thank you. I have Judith. My calendar is right here. Bless you. <laughs> Man, you're good at that. I actually... We'll talk after. I um, feel like I could stay on track with her. Hey, new series always get me excited. And this one, okay, we're kicking it off. It's called City of Light. It's a study on the book of Ephesians. So today we're in Ephesians chapter one. We're gonna go right through the book together this fall. And City of Light, this is an interesting thing because when Paul got to the city of Ephesus, it was a very dark place spiritually. They were not only worshiping false gods, but they were manufacturing idols in the fashion of their God. And they were um, worship. They were so upset that Paul started preaching about Jesus that they they started to riot and they they were going to kill him. And so it's a very interesting thing: the darkness that was over the city of Ephesus spiritually. But as God allowed Paul to share the gospel, and the gospel penetrated, the light came in, and it became a city of light. And I believe that's so true. And what's needed in our world today is for each one of us to enter into this culture that is becoming more and more dark and to be the city of light. As each one of us decides, hey, I'm the light of the world, and we come together, we become a city of light. And God has not called us as the church to sit back and curse and complain and criticize the darkness. He's just called us to shine the light and become his city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And I'm fired up because like this weekend, I had such a cool uh, picture of what that looks like, the difference one person can make. Let me just tell you, because I did a memorial service for Lake County Master Deputy Brad Link here at Real Life, and I got the chills just now because the impact that one life can make, that man was a light. Uh, Everybody who testified about him just testified to the light that he was. I'm proud to have been his pastor. I'm proud that he had called real life his church. We had over 2,000 uniformed officers from all over the United States in this room. And I've never seen anything like it. I've been doing, I've been a pastor for 150 years and I've never seen anything like this. I was blown away. The impact of one life, one light. And I thought, man, if, if we get that and we live that and we come together, I was just so thankful uh, for who Brad was and how he lived and that he's living today. And I'm like, Lord, I, wanna, I, I don't wanna burn out, I wanna burn up, right? I wanna be a light for you and I wanna live like it. And so that's what we're talking about. We're gonna be that city of light. Um, and by the way, it is nice after preaching to a room full of uniformed officers, it is nice to see you guys, okay? Little stiff yesterday. They were kind of like, I was like, hey, we can, you know, we've got hope. And it was just like, y'all, because I get it, man, the discipline and the and a, a tough crowd. And w- one of the guys pulled me up, officer pulled me and goes, you did good. It's a tough crowd. And I was like, thank you. Thank you for saying that. They just, <laughs> it was great though. We, we uh, man, I just, the blessing of God using our church to provide so much hope and a light. It was broadcast on all the news stations all around Central Florida. I just thought, what an amazing thing. Again, okay, so Ephesians chapter one. I'm gonna read this to you, starting with verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like his kind of standard introduction, but then he says this. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is a beautiful promise. I gotta stop there for just a second because he has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. It's a beautiful promise. Uh, There's some problems, I think, with the promise. He says we, he's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. And, and I think there's this thing in all of us that's kind of like, all right, cool. 
that's nice, right? I got every spiritual blessing, kind of like you are now. It's like, okay, anything else? Is there anything else in there? Uh, you know, like cash, Venmo, cash app, like, is there a car in there for me? Like every spiritual blessing, I, I think there's this thing where there's a beautiful promise and gift that God's offering, but the thing most people are looking for isn't necessarily what God says he has for them. There's a little bit of a disconnect where he says, hey, here's what I have for you. In Christ, you have every spiritual blessing, and a lot of people will be going, that's great, but the blessings I need are physical, temporal, like earthly. And he's like, what, what, I, what I have for you is spiritual, eternal, and heavenly. And, and it's just this, every spiritual blessing means, yeah, maybe, I think that's what I need, but I'm not sure it's what I want. Parents, do your kids ever tell you they're hungry? You're like, all the time. That's like, this is our, the nature of our relationship, right? When their kids, I'm hungry. You know what I'm saying? And they look at you like, if I just state a problem, your job is to fix it. I'm hungry. And I'm like, okay, well, you know what? Then, um, you know, okay, if you're a mom, hold on, two different reactions, right? Because if you're a mom, immediately you're like, oh, okay, honey, what do you feel like? And if you're a dad, what, there's actually a, a set line if you're a dad. That's what I love about being a dad. They hand you a script. And if you tell a dad, I'm hungry, there's only one response. Nice to meet you, hungry. I'm dad. <laughs> Got him, right? <laughs> the cool thing about being a dad is you can say dumb stuff and call it parenting. <laughs> Pretty good dad. Yeah, he's like, I'm hungry. I'm like, I'm dad. Nice to meet you. So, wow, good one. Mom's though, it's like, oh, I gotta provide for my kid. And it's like, I'm hungry. And I'm like, you're 22 years old, Elijah. <laughs> you know, go to Chipotle, okay? <laughs> I would, but the seed oils. Anyway, so I'm hungry. We, we state the problem. Here's what's interesting, okay? Because imagine your kid comes up to you, it's like, I'm hungry. And you're like, oh, perfect. You're in luck. Because I just, imagine your little eight year old, I just sauteed spinach with garlic fresh from the garden. What's the reaction? Ew. Like, why would you even offer me that? That's an insult. I want Cheez-Its and applesauce, and you just offered me spinach, and it's like, spinach is actually, like, really good for you. It's what you need. You were talking about, you know, it's got vitamins and minerals and all the things, and, and it's like, but if you were to offer a little kid spinach when they said they were hungry, they would say, ooh, and they would just keep being hungry. Interesting thing. When our kids were young and they were growing up, we would give them a choice. You can have dinner or not. Because I believe in choice. I believe in free will. I'm like, it's not fair to not give them a choice. And you have a choice. You can either eat dinner or not. Mom made this. You can choose that or hunger. And it's amazing how often they chose dinner over hunger, right? But not all the time, because sometimes it was fish, and they were like, no. So what I think is, for so many of us, a lot of us are choosing spiritual hunger because we don't want the blessings Jesus offers. We're chasing the snack food, low shelf, junk food, cheap stuff in life. We just want God, I mean, if we're honest, the American definition of blessing is just fix my problems, send the money, you know, I'll take care of the rest. Just deposit into my bank account and I can handle it from there. But make this go away. Just fix the things that are in front of me. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. Like, that's so cool. Uh, could you write a check? <laughs> My peace I give to you. And so we want him to take away our problems. He says, I'm giving you peace that's greater than all of your problems. Every spiritual blessing. You see the difference, the tension for us. And here's the thing. The spiritual blessing is always greater than the blessing that I'm chasing. The temporary, the physical, the snack food blessing. He says, hold out for the better blessing. It, it, Every spiritual blessing, here's the thing about spiritual blessings. When we have the spiritual blessing that God's offering, you could take or leave the physical blessing. It's an interesting thing. You can have all the physical blessings and still never have the spiritual satisfaction, but when you have the spiritual blessing, Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content in any situation. Well-fed, hungry, rich, or poor, it doesn't matter because I have the spiritual blessing. So I'm okay either way, regardless of my physical status. See, we think our blessing depends on our, our physical situation or status. No, the spiritual satisfaction far surpasses and doesn't rely on physical status. And the truth is, you could have all the physical blessing in the world, 
all the health, wealth, money, and still not be spiritually satisfied? And what good would it be if the, a person gains the whole world, Jesus says, but forfeits their soul? You know, physical blessings, here's the truth, they rarely lead to spiritual satisfaction. That's just true. You could have all the money. You'll never have enough stuff to have peace. It'll always elude you. You'll never have a house big enough to have hope for eternity. You'll never lease a car nice enough to teach you how to love your neighbor and love the Lord your God. What, we're chasing what God can do for us, and he's focused on what he's trying to do in us. And what he says is, guys, you have every spiritual blessing in Christ. If The truth is, if God never did another thing for us, we'd still owe him, him the rest of our lives for what he's already done. And, and I think part of the problem is sometimes we're still praying about the things we need when we should be maybe praising him for the things he's already provided. I'm not saying don't pray, but I'm saying if you're gonna pray, go ahead and praise because there's things that you lack, but there's things that he's given. There's things that you need, but there's things that he's already done. There's things that are still yet to happen, but there's things that have already happened. And praise him. Paul starts off the letter with that, right? He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's start with, let's enter into his gates with praise and thanksgiving. The promise that God put inside of us is bigger than the problems around us. And we gotta understand that as Christians, our attitude, our posture, our response to God, it should start with praise. Whatever we're going through in this world, we take heart because he's overcome the world. So I think one of the reasons so many people are missing out on the blessing, he says we have them all. We have every spiritual blessing. Well, we're looking for the wrong blessing. We're looking for the wrong thing. And I think another reason we're missing the blessing is because we're looking in the wrong places. He's given us, it says, in the heavenly realms, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing where? In Christ, in Christ is every spiritual blessing. And I, if I could just tell you right now, I know so many people who are looking for the things that only Christ provides, but they're looking everywhere but Christ. And we're looking for the blessing, but we look in all the wrong places. We look at all the wrong people. We look for stuff and things and experiences. I, I was thinking... <laughs> Me at home, I'm always looking for something at home. And I, I'm noticing a trend. It's not getting better as I get older. And I can get lost in a pantry, y'all. And we don't have a big pantry, you know, but I can just stare. And it's so interesting. When I go to the fridge, because I'm hungry, and I open the French door fridge and I look inside, I, I rarely find food in the refrigerator. It's full, but I can't find food. And so I'll just close the thing and walk away because I missed it and there's nothing. And Robin would be like, what are you looking for, babe? I was like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's not in there. And she's like, oh, well, what are you looking for? And I was like, I was looking for food. And she's like, oh, you're looking in the wrong place. And I was like, no, I was looking in the fridge. That's where we put it. It's not in there. And she's like, well, would, how about the leftovers from Thursday? Would you want those? I was like, I mean, yeah, actually, that'd be really good. Well, top shelf in, in the little container with the lid, it's behind the bread. And if you just move the, and I'm like, what is this sorcery? The woman has a mental map of our refrigerator she carries around with her. I'm lost, and she's like, I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map. Like, I was just here and it wasn't there, and then you put it there in your mind. Somebody spin a top, you know? I mean, is this inception? What's going on? I'm in the matrix. This woman knows her way around the fridge. I'm like, well, and she goes, and if you don't want that, how about the steak? I'm like, steak? I always want steak blue container behind the condensed coconut milk. I'm like, I don't know what that is. With the rubber band around the, and I'm like, what in the world? This woman, she goes, looking in the wrong place. You're looking for it, but you, you don't know where to, I talked, I'm telling you, man, I talked to so many people. The very things they're looking for are found in and only in Christ. But that's the one place they're not looking like, man, I just, this world, and I just, I, I don't know, man, I just feel like I don't have any hope. I'm like, oh, I know the hope of the world. I'm gonna tell you, like, hope not just for the world, but hope beyond this world. Like, I mean, not the kind of hope that gets you through, the kind of hope that just, you, you wake up every day believing for so much more, and you fix your eyes on this hope, and yeah, I don't know, man, I'm not really a church person. I'm like, I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about, yeah, I don't know, I'm not religious. I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about Jesus, you know, and 
I don't know. I'm just like, okay. But you're looking and you're telling me and you can't find it and I'm telling you who and where it is. People tell, you know, I just, I just want, I have so much anxiety and just, man, I'm, I know the Prince of Peace. Do you wanna know him? Eh, I don't know. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, you're a preacher. And no, I'm telling you what you're looking for is here and it's in him, but it's only in him and you're looking everywhere but him. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ. We can't look to the culture for the cure. Guys, the culture is the cancer. It's not that Jesus is the cure, but I see so many, even Christians, looking to the culture to lift them up, to prop them up, to make them feel better, to medicate and entertain and distract. And I'm telling you, the answer is not out there. It's in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. Paul was looking for the spiritual bless for the blessing. Jesus says, "Here's what I'll tell you: My grace." is sufficient for you. It's enough, it's all you need, and it's in me. And I don't know, you probably heard this one. This one gets me, but you'll never know Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. That's an if you know, you know. If you've been there, right? If you've been in that place where Jesus is all you have, that's when you find out, oh, he's enough. I can't believe all I had was Jesus. Listen, and some of you, that's a desperate place. I'm telling you, I'm down to where like all I have left is Jesus. If all you have is Jesus, you have all you need. You're gonna be okay. His grace is sufficient. He will get you through. We wanna think, you know, like, well, Jesus is good for some things, right? You know, Jesus is like, oh yeah, I'm kind of feeling in a certain way. Maybe I'll pray. Maybe I'll, re maybe I'll go to church. Jesus is good for some things. For everything else, there's MasterCard, you know, okay? <laughs> Retail therapy and I'll go get that, and, but no, Jesus is the thing. He's every spiritual blessing, it's in him. If you need it, he's got it. If you lack it, he supplies it. And what our brother James tells us in James chapter four is the reason you don't have is because you don't ask God. You're missing the source of blessing. You live beneath the blessing. We live stressed when we could live blessed. Why? Because we're looking for the wrong things and we're looking in the wrong things places. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ. And I'm telling you, like, when you think about Christ, he's the one, the Bible says, in whom all things hold together. That's a promise. My world just feels so hectic and chaotic, like it's coming apart at the scene. Like, he holds all things together. That spiritual blessing you need, he's got it. Go get it. Go to him for that thing. Uh, the name above every other name. Like, if you don't know where to look, Get on your tippy toes and reach up, okay? Because it's on the top shelf. It's Jesus. He's the name above. All the other things you're reaching for are beneath. Don't get on that lower shelf. Get on that stool. And I lift my eyes up to the mountains from whence my help comes from. He's, there, it, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Salvation is found in no one else. In Christ, in Christ alone, cornerstone capstone, the foundation, the rock, the river of life, the way, the truth, the life, the light of the world, the bread of heaven. When somebody eats this bread, they're not hungry anymore. It's him, man, I'm telling you, in Christ. So part of our problem, and I love the way the book of Ephesians starts because we forget what we have in him, but we also forget who we are in him. And so I gotta keep reading because we're only three verses in and you're like, this is gonna take two years. This is a short book. I know, okay, let me keep reading because I think we're missing the blessings that we have in him, looking for the wrong things in the wrong places. We're also finding our identity in things way less than Christ. And this is messing us up as a culture. But to do what God called us to do, to be that city of light, we have to know who God created us to be. Verse four says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So much in there. He's like, don't forget what you have in him. Don't forget who you are in him. You have been adopted. I love this, this word. He says adoption. And I think that's a power. Like I've met a lot of families in our church who have, 
who have uh, gotten children through the process of adoption, talked to one recently, got a beautiful daughter from Africa. And they were telling me the story because we had prayed early on. And I mean, years of working and waiting and then the, the cost, not just of the time, the people, they were like, you don't understand, the people we had to pay off, the situations we were in, and I was like, you gotta give me a ballpark figure just in case the Lord ever puts it on my wife's heart. I just gotta know. Because you know, <laughs> you know how he is in her. I'm like, Christ in her really messes up my checkbook. So I'm like, <laughs> I just gotta know. And they were like, it, tens of thousands of dollars. I was like, whoa. And, but they both said, said, oh, but she was worth it. I was like, well, that's so beautiful. Like, because I, I said, you got to understand, you got a, you got a daughter, so whatever it costs to get her here, the payments just started. We still have college, weddings, fingernail polish, dress, like, I don't even want to tell you. Like, I had a couple of those. Anyway, adopt, they both said, though, she's, she's just worth it. And, and that's how God feels about each one of us. It's the most beautiful. The price he paid to bring us into the family it's, it's unimaginable when we count the cost of the cross, his one and only son giving his life. There is no greater love. There is no greater price. He paid it. And what Paul says, this phrase is, it was for his good pleasure. He wanted to do it because maybe you've heard this. He's crazy about you. God is crazy about each one of us so much so that he's like, that's gonna cost me a fortune and it's worth it. You're worth it. And I want you in the family but do we get how loved we are? Do we get what a big deal it is? Uh, John, the apostle, uh, John says in 1 John, he, he says in chapter three, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. I love that word, extravagantly blessed, lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. There, it's crazy, in the Bible, there aren't a lot of exclamation points. There are two in that one verse. Why? Because God's saying, I don't think you get it. I want you right here. I want just, you gotta understand how much I love you and how much I went through to adopt you. It's lavish love. It's crazy love. And, and I believe part of the reason that so many of us live beneath the blessing is because we've lost our sense of belonging. We've lost our identity in him. And we don't know who we are. We're drifting all around in this world trying to figure that out. We don't know who we are because we forgot whose we are. I'm his and he's adopted me. When you know I am a blood-bought child of the king. He paid the ultimate price to bring me in the family and now nobody can revoke that. I, I have his name. I'm a co-heir with Christ. What's his is mine. We inherit the same thing. He gave it to me and when he sees me, he sees his son in good standing. Man, when you know who you are, it changes how you are. And we're in a culture that chases identity in so many ways and looking for it in so many things. And I'm telling you, when, we, when you know you're his and you begin to live like it, it changes everything. So that concept of adoption, there's another word that jumps out here in Ephesians 1 verse 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. It's a beautiful thing. And, and he made known to, oh, I'm sorry, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according, there it is again, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. We have adoption, and then he tells us we have redemption. Redemption is a, is a really, it's a cool Greek word. It's a, it's a very long Greek word, but it means to buy back something that's been lost or forfeited. Essentially something that was kind of like put in the dumpster and somehow it made its way uh, into the antique road show, right? And it, it all of a sudden it has value again. God takes these things that didn't have value and he brings them back to life. He brings them back to value, redeem, redemption. Uh, one of the things, so my dad and I have a shared passion, it's guitars. My dad loves guitars. I think the reason I love guitars so much and I like playing guitars is because um, my dad just, it's funny, you walk into his, he has, he has a small room in his place. It's a little bitty man cave, but every square inch of that thing is guitars. 
and guitar-related products and a little workstation because he's a luthier, so he likes to work on guitars. There are very few guitars he hasn't touched, worked on, handled, you know, and so when I go in there, what's really cool is each one of the guitars on his wall has a story because the, the particular passion of my dad is to take, like, cheap guitars, discarded guitars, guitars other people don't really put a value on and make them play like expensive guitars. So I'll see a guitar on the wall and I'm like, oh, that's one of those, yeah, okay, yeah, that's not really very expensive. And I'll pick it up and I'll play it. I'm like, yo, this thing plays better than my, he goes, yeah, exactly. He gets a little smile on his face, like I did that, right? Like I can take this and I can make it. So I was like, dad, I think I want that, I want that. And so he's like, well, let's find, let's find an old beater guitar. My dad helped me find this guitar. It looks like literally we found it in a dumpster. It, I gotta show you a picture of this thing. This is now one of my favorite guitars. It's, it's so light and it plays so good. And he's, he's been working on it. And he's like, we gotta adjust the fret and we gotta tone down this and we gotta shim this up. And I'm like, okay, cool, just make it sound good. And it's starting, to, it's starting to become one of the best guitars I've ever had. And it was like $180. And I'm like, dad, this is the coolest thing. He goes, this is what I love to do. And I think, you know, Paul says, when he says this to me, this is what I thought of, because in him, in Christ, we have redemption. God takes us as he finds us, broken, busted, bruised, beat down, and whatever, and to his glory, he makes us play like new again. He gives us new life. He, he makes us that thing that people go, whoa, how did you, I thought that was just a, and now it's, he goes, yeah, that's what I do. I, I, I see us all as like hanging on God's wall, you know, and people are like, isn't that the, the preacher, isn't that the guy that was, oh yeah, uh-huh, you think he's bad now. You should have seen him when I first played. <laughs> to his glory, to the praise of his glorious grace, we have redemption in him. Where we once had no value, he's brought us back to life and he's given us new worth and new identity and new value. And just these words that remind us who we are and all the work that he's put into us. There are times in my life, I just wanna tell you this, Times in my life where I've just wanted to give up. I'm like, I just, I, I, I can't do this. Maybe I'm not worthy of that. I'm not good at it. And then, you know, the thing the Holy Spirit has reminded me of that's kept me going more than anything is don't forget how much work I put into you. I will get a return on my investment. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. This isn't even about me. You did all the work. You, you did all the fixing and you did, and you're proud of the product. You know it's not there yet. He began a work and he's still carrying it to completion, but he is gonna get a return on his investment. Just keep showing up and let him do his thing. We have adoption. We have redemption. There's another word that jumped out at me here and it's beautiful. And uh, let me read it to you. In verse 11, it says, in him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, including your life and mine, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, that's them, might be for the praise of his glory. There it is again, praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. We have adoption, we've been brought into the family, we have redemption, we've been brought back to life, and we are his possession. We're, you and I, he says, I claim that, that one's mine. Psalm 100, it says that we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. It's a beautiful thing. All through the Bible, this imagery that he's our shepherd, we're, we're just a sheep. By the way, not a compliment. Had some sheep over to the house one time, and man, ate a lot of carpet and peed in places I didn't agree with. <laughs> it's not a compliment, but it's comforting to know that I'm his. I'm his possession. All that goes with me, he said, I'll, I'll take responsibility for that. It may look like a mess to you, but it's my mess. It may have some baggage, but that's my baggage. I, I can carry it. You can cast all those cares on me because I care for you. It's a beautiful thing. He says, you're my possession. God doesn't take that lightly. With me comes a lot, but he says, it's okay. I, I take it. And, and the weight, the worry, the work and striving and stress that comes off of me when I transfer ownership to him, when I give him my life. So, you know, I was, 
I was asking you to bless me and to help me, and I'm just saying, no, you're Lord. And I transfer that, and he says, man, the, the burden that's lifted when you give me your life, the stress that's taken off, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. He says, come to me, just be my sheep. You're my possession. I wanna care for you. I wanna love you. I wanna lead you. First Corinthians Chapter six, it's, it just reminds us, it says you were, you were not your own. You were bought at a price. When I think about the claim that God has to my life, wouldn't be here if he hadn't breathed his breath of life into me in the first place. If he hadn't created me from the dust of the ground with his own hands, I, I wouldn't exist. But I'm here because he created me. I'm also here because he was crucified for me. I'm twice his. He, he built me and he bought me. I have life because of his breath and I have eternal life because of his death. I'm twice his. He's, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. I paid for you. I've ransomed you. You're adopted. You're redeemed. You're my possession. When I get that, I get all that comes with that and I get his son who's sitting at the right, standing interceding for me, saying my name, putting in a word for me to the Father and I have a spirit living inside me guiding and counseling and healing and helping. You're not your own. You're bought at a price. He says, you're my possession. You're my responsibility. And I don't take that lightly. It's a beautiful thing when we, you know, we just opened the book of Ephesians and we're confronted with what we have in him, every spiritual blessing in Christ. We're reminded of who we are in him. We're the adopted sons and daughters of the king. This lifts it elevates, it encourages, it gives hope and life. We know what we have in him and who we are in him. We can start to live as he's called us to live. But I, I wanna do something, and, and I've asked the worship team to actually come back out because four times in this opening few verses of Ephesians, it says we praise him to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory, God, praise be to. And, and I think, you know, one of the problems in our life is that we are, we're praying to God for things we don't have and we're, we're, we're not praising God for the things he's already given us. And there's something powerful when we choose to praise. When the praises go up, the power comes down and we all need it. He says, praise be to God. Let's not forget that our response, our posture to God should be one of praise. The truth is if he never did another thing for us, we'd still owe him the rest of our lives for what he gave us on the cross. That one thing alone and there's been so many things. And so I know we all need things and we're praying for things and we're asking for things. What is it that he's done? Could we praise him today? Could we let that light in? Could we collectively become that city of light, those people who know who they are and what they have in him, and they let him know? I want you to know today he's good. He's good. He has good plans for you. He's created you for good works and a good purpose and the plans he has for you in eternity, no mind can even conceive. No eye has ever seen. You can trust him with that. He's good. He has good plans for you and he'll make good out of your bad. Some of us were so focused on what's wrong that the Holy Spirit today wants to remind us of what's right, of what we have and who we are. Let's pray to him and then let's sing. Lord, thank you. I needed this reminder. This was a perfect time in my life to just be lifted elevated and have my eyes readjusted and fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of my faith. Thank you, Lord. There's so much broken in each of our lives, but there is beauty in that brokenness. Thank you, God. I want to thank you today that I have every spiritual blessing in Christ, each one of us. And I want to quit going to other things to get that blessing. And I want to come directly to you because that's where it is. We have that, Lord, and so we wanna claim that blessing. We wanna receive that blessing, every spiritual blessing in Christ. I wanna thank you that we are more than the culture says we are. We are more than we woke up thinking we are. We're adopted, we're redeemed, we're your possession. God, when we get who we are, we can start living like it. And I pray that we would become a city of light, reflecting your glory and shining in this dark world for our good and to the praise of your glorious grace. It's in your name we pray, amen. Come on, real life, let's stand together. Let's go out worshiping.
Let's go out lifting up praise to our God. Let's go out celebrating today. Come on, put your hands together with us this morning. hope God spoke to you today through the message and the time of worship. Don't forget, if you need prayer, just email us your prayer request to prayer at real.life. We'd love to hear from you and pray with you for whatever needs you have. We love you guys and we're hoping you have an amazing week. Don't forget, God's crazy about you.